Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The first lesson of Ecclesiastes comes in the first verse of the first chapter, which says this, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And with the author here being hesitantly identified because of his disappointing background, we learned first and foremost a few weeks ago that we need to look beyond the messenger. We mentioned that divine inspiration doesn't require a perfect person. It doesn't require a perfect messenger. God can choose to communicate truth to whomever he wants, and he can choose to communicate truth through whomever he wants, how be a person or animal and uh, condition of that individual or creatures up to the Lord. And so we find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we need to look beyond, we need to look beyond the conduit and accept the truth that comes through that conduit. We can't be like Nathaniel who said of Christ when he heard about Christ, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Remember that? He, he was discriminating against Christ at least his legitimacy, just because of his hometown. Uh, that was a mistake because, yes, not only can a good thing come out of Nazareth, the best thing can come out of Nazareth. And we don't ever want to be guilty of saying, can any good thing come out of that person, that church, that book, that movement, that area? Ah, God can choose to use whatever he wants. And sometimes he chooses to use those things we dislike or are discriminated against just to humble us. You know how hard it is to accept truth from someone we vehemently disagree with? It requires some humility. So sometimes God will do that just to humble us. In fact, remember when Christ came and the scribes, Pharisees, and all these upper echelon religious people wouldn't praise him, but the kids would? And Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? And these, you know, educated religious men have had to humble themselves to admit that maybe God was using children instead of them. It's a humbling thing, so you never know what God will do. We learned our second lesson in verses 2 through 11, where Solomon writes these words. He writes in verse 2, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. So this is the chiefest of vanity. All is vanity. This is the proposition of the book. Everything is like a vapor. It's lacking in substance. It doesn't satisfy. The world is never at rest. It's never content. It's never fulfilled. He then provokes thought in verse 3 by saying, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Generations come and go. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The sun comes and goes. Verse 6, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. The wind comes and goes. Verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Water comes and goes. Verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with with hearing. The eye is never satisfied, the ear is never satisfied, the nose is never satisfied, taste is never satisfied, touch is never satisfied. Our senses long for more and more. Verse number nine, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no, no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. He's saying nothing is new. Same old, same old. And he wasn't complaining about life under the sun. He was simply stating the facts. He wasn't speaking bitterly or scornfully about life under the sun because... We might think it didn't turn out well for him. No, he was stating the facts about life under the sun because they are all unfulfilling. They're unsatisfying. And what Psalm was doing in these verses was giving his readers lifelong observations 
and conclusions so that his readers would set wise expectations about what life was to be and what it wasn't to be. He was encouraging his readers not to waste their lives chasing dreams here because eventually they would all fail to fulfill. The second lesson in this book comes from a man who had everything. Power, wealth, romance, fame, attention. He had everything. And we learned this second lesson in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and that's this. We're to set our affections on things above the sun, not on things under the sun. Well, we've got to give our hearts to the one above the sun, not to the world below the sun. And that alone will fulfill us. We're going to look at the rest of the chapter this evening, uh, verses 12 through 18, and they're going to teach us a final lesson in the first chapter. But to learn this lesson, we have to remove again the prejudice that comes with this book. We have to see Solomon for who he was, not for who we think he was. So let's move forward to verse 12. Here's the outline tonight. We're going to see the identification of verse 12. He writes, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, if you're paying attention tonight, you know that he already identified himself, but 11 verses earlier, in verse number 1, these are the words of the preacher, son of David, king of Israel. So it's interesting that he repeats himself so quickly about who he is. In fact, the wording, though, compared to verse 1 and the timing, as far as the location in the chapter, are both going to give us some insight into what the rest of the chapter is all about. So this verse is not insignificant. All scripture is given by inspiration. It's profitable for many things. This is going to have a, a key part in interpreting the rest of the chapter. And I want you to look at the difference between verses 1 and verses 12. In verse number 1, we see that Solomon identifies himself as king in Jerusalem. And in verse number 12, he identifies himself as king over Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, this isn't, knowing Solomon and his, re, and his writings, uh, there's nothing insignificant about these subtle differences. In verse number 1, he's identifying his title. He says, I'm the king. But in verse 12, he's identifying the responsibility that comes with that title. Yeah, I've got the crown, but the crown comes with a lot of responsibility. I was over, I was on top of, I was, I was overseeing, I was ruling, I was leading all of Israel. Hey, the crown comes with a lot of responsibility. He said, I was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, by the way, I wasn't just over a people. I wasn't just over a city. I wasn't just a mayor or a town superintendent. I was the king over an entire nation. God's people. Heavy duty responsibilities being king and being king over God's people. So note that there's a difference in those two verses, and we'll explain it in a moment. There's a second difference in the verses. And in verse number one, he says, I was the king in Jerusalem. Verse 12, though, he writes, I, I the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Was king. Was king. Was king. Well, verse number one, he says, I'm the king. I'm the guy writing this book. Verse 12, he says, I was the king. Now, if you know anything about the crown, it wasn't passed to children before the king died. It could be, but it wasn't. And to our knowledge, what we have in the scriptures here, Solomon didn't pass the crown to Rehoboam before he died. When a, when a king died, that crown would fall to the eldest son or the son of choice. And so he's not saying that when I'm writing this book, I'm no longer king. He's still the king when he's writing the book. So then why would he say I was king? He's directing us to the past because what he's about to tell us took place in the past. It's an important distinction because of our prejudice attached with this, with this book. So what he's about to tell us in verses 13 through 18 has to do with a specific time in his past, but a time after he became king. So verse 1 identifies who the author of Ecclesiastes was and who he was at the time that he wrote the book. But verse 12 tells us that there is a lot of responsibility to being king. This was heavy on his heart at some time in the past. And he's going to tell us what he did when it was heavy on his heart. Verse 13, we will then see the motivation. Verse 13, he says, 
And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. Let's recap. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. What he is saying, he is saying, at some time in the past, when I was king and I was over this great nation, I chose intentionally to give my heart to search and to seek out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. What we're about to read, and it's important that you understand this because the prejudice attached with this book leads us often to conclude that Solomon did what he's about to tell us he did when he was older, when he was backslidden. Because of the stained reputation of the book, it's easy to conclude in about the next few verses that he did something ill-advised. But we're, what we're about to read is not in any way ill-advised. It was an excellent thing he did. But before we read on, I need you to go to 1 Kings chapter 3 with me. Because of verse 12 telling us it happened in the past, because it told us he was contemplating his responsibility very seriously, I believe what we're about to read in 1 Kings 3 was what initiated Ecclesiastes 1.13. So that what you read in Ecclesiastes 1, you can understand, was not written by an older, bitter, backslidden man. It was written by a young man, actually. Not the book, but the account that he's about to give had to do when he was a young man. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant, referring to himself, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. I'm going to pause and point out that this is the moment that Solomon is saying, you, God, put me over Israel. Remember, he said in Ecclesiastes 1.12, I was king over Israel and Jerusalem. He's realizing the responsibilities that come with being king. And he goes on to say to God, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. He says, I don't know the ins and outs of ruling. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people. Remember, I'm over Israel. Thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Do you get the impression he's a little overwhelmed? Get the impression that he realizes he has a task that's bigger than him? He goes on to tell God, verse 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? This is Solomon saying, I was king over the whole nation. That God put me there, and I had to deal with God's people, and this was too much for me. I'm like a little kid. I don't know the ins and outs of ruling. And so he asked God for an understanding heart. He asked for wisdom. Verse number 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to, to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And what he does when he awakes is he goes to Jerusalem. He's not in Jerusalem at the time of this, but he goes to Jerusalem. And that's where he sits on the throne and begins the rest of his throne. When Solomon became king as a young man, he recognized the gravity of the position he was filling. He was overwhelmed with the responsibility of ruling such a large amount of people who, by the way, were God's people. And he knew he needed wisdom and understanding 
to be able to rule them properly. And so he begged God of all the things he wanted, an understanding heart to discern good from bad, to know right from wrong. And he wanted God to give him wisdom so he could rule the people properly. And I believe right after God gave it to him, remember God gave him an understanding and a wise heart. I believe as soon as God gave it to him, he went to Jerusalem and he intently, Ecclesiastes 1.13, gave his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under the sun. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 23. When Solomon got wisdom, he was committed to applying it to be the best king he could be. When he got wisdom, he engaged his heart to know as much as he could know about humanity and the world so he could judge the people properly. And so Solomon set out on a mission to study humanity, to study the tendencies of man, to study relationships, to study trends. And he studied with the intent of allowing God's wisdom to govern him and his conclusions. Proverbs chapter 23 when was, he, uh, when was Proverbs written? Was it when Solomon was a young man or an old man? That's what we do in Sunday school class, by the way. If you're not in our class, this is more of a class than anything. So participation is welcome. Young man or old man? Old man. <laughs> oh, man, I'm failing. How old was Solomon when he wrote Proverbs? Was he younger or older? Older. I'm failing. He was younger. So, I know, I, I'm tricking you. I realize that. Not intentionally. We'll start over. How old was Solomon when he wrote the Song of Solomon? Now you're all afraid to answer. He said, yes. He was younger. We know this because he was full of passion and romance. And there were no references to children. When he wrote the book of Proverbs, was he older or younger than when he was when he wrote the Song of Solomon? Older. Older. How old do you think? Old enough to have kids? 32. <laughs> Smash is 32. I like that. I like that. It's in the Hebrew somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. We know he was older because he wrote often to whom? His son. His son. So Song of Solomon, Book of Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes, he was much older given the content of it. But the point being is he wrote the Book of Proverbs when he was younger than he was in Ecclesiastes. In fact, it would have been probably just after sometime his, his Gibeon encounter with God, but well before he started to let the women into his life that he did, who were pagan women. Anyways, that was not supposed to be challenging. I apologize. Verse 29, though, keep in mind, he's a younger man. And he writes in verse 29 of chapter 23, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? You see, he is, this is an investigator, a scientist, who has done some research on people, watched people. And he's, he's saying, hmm, people that have all these things, wounds and babbling, redness of eye, contentions. He says, verse 30, I'll tell you who they are. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. And then he advises his son, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. <laughs> Or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast, you'll be sicker than a dog. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, but I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Now we read through that as just, oh, some good sayings about alcohol in the book of Proverbs. This is written by a young man who has set out by the wisdom God gave him to seek and to search uh, all things done under the sun. He's watching people and he's, he's sitting there and taking notes and he's, he's making observations. He just didn't say, no drink wine, no drink alcohol. He's saying, what do people do when they drink wine? What happens when people drink too much alcohol? And he would sit there and just watch when people came out of the bars. He would sit there and watch 
when someone drank too much. And he would make observations. Just look at their eyes. Look at the way they talk. Look at the problems they have with other relationships. Look at how they vomit. They get seasick. And you know what? When they awake, they want it all over again. So he writes down all these observations. And he's learning about humanity. Turn to chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. We see a young man, a wise man, who is searching out all things done under the sun. And he says in verse 30, I went by the field of the slothful. Verse 30, chapter 24. I went by the field of the slothful, and I went by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And, lo, look, it was all grown over with thorns. Nettles had covered the face thereof. The stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and I, I considered it well. I looked upon it and I received instruction. That's wisdom. Yet he said a little sleep, just a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Yeah, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. He's intentionally walking through his community, through his people, and he's taking note and he says, all right, I know that guy's lazy. I've seen him. Look at his house. Look at the stone wall. It's broken down. Look at the thorns. Ah, ah, he says. Just a little laziness, a little sleep, and you'll become impoverished. He's watching, observing, learning, and then applying it to his, himself. Turn over to chapter 6. I think we assume that Solomon woke up one day, got wisdom from God, and then went into his castle and just started writing books. I think we assume he had these visions of all this wisdom and, and all, everything there was to know about man, he got right there and then. That's not true at all. God gave him wisdom to apply what he saw and to make sense of what he saw. But he gave his heart to seek and to search out concerning all things that are done under heaven. Proverbs chapter 6, another super cool observation that he gives great detail to. In verse 25, he says to his son, Lust not after her beauty, referring to an adulteress, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. He saw how women can bat their eyes. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Now look at what he says. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? The obvious answer is no. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. And then he says, I've watched men, I know men. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Oh, man, you do that, you'll destroy your own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Verse 34, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He won't care what type of ransom you give. He won't rest content no matter how many gifts you give. How did Solomon know that? How did Solomon know that a man wouldn't spare in the day of vengeance? That a man who took another man's wife, there's nothing he could do to appease the man who was victimized. How did he know that? Do you think he got this wisdom from God and can just see inside the soul of man? Or do you think maybe he peered out his window a lot and said, oh man, those guys are going at it. And he dug deeper and he learned what happens in the event that someone commits adultery and the other guy gets involved. And he learned by observing. He learned by watching. And instead of just walking by and minding his own business, he would sit there, take notes, he would ponder it. He gave his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning the things that are done under the heaven. He intentionally studied men so he could know what to do. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I think we'll stay there for the rest of the message. Yes, we will. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. <clears throat> you see, when Solomon became king, 
he got wisdom from God, and then he went out to understand mankind for the good of his people. What he did was necessary for his duty as a king. And because he did what he did, he became a better king, and the people were better for it. Now keep these historical facts in mind when we read the second half of Ecclesiastes 1.13. He says, I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. What did he just say, right? How many times you read that and said, oh, I don't know what that means. This sore travail, what's he referring to? He's referring to the investigation of mankind. He's referring to giving his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all those things concerning uh, mankind. And he says, my investigation is a sore travail. It's a painful labor. And God has given it to the sons of men to exercise this therewith. Remember in the Garden of Eden, what was the name of the tree that man wasn't supposed to eat? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We were never supposed to have the knowledge of evil. But because we sinned, life got very complicated, didn't it? Life wasn't supposed to be complicated. Life wasn't supposed to be painful. It wasn't supposed to be hurtful. But because we've done that, mankind is very complicated. We have a lot of layers to us, a lot of emotional, spiritual, physical layers. And I don't know about you, but you probably haven't figured us all out yet. And to figure out mankind, you know, why does she do that? What, why does he do that? What's going on with that one? Why does she think that way? Why does he act that way? It's a sore travail. And we constantly are trying to figure out ourselves out, figure out people and this is what exercises us emotionally, physically, spiritually. Why does man have the tendencies that he does? Why does man have the feelings that he does? Why does my wife act that way? Why does my husband act that way? All these things, they're exercising us and not necessarily in a good way because it is a sore travail. And for a leader, this curiosity, this investigation of the human soul, of the human behavior, of the human activity in which we're submerged in, it is a painful study, but it's necessary. If you're going to be a king, you've got to learn to know your people. If you're going to be a parent, you've got to learn to know your children. If you're going to be a pastor, you've got to learn to know your congregation. You've got to know people if you're going to be of any use to governing and managing them and to try to figure out how we tick and how we talk. It's a sore travail. It's a sore travail. This investigation, however, is a part of life for all of us. It just happens to be a greater part for those who govern. So this was the investigation. Uh, his motivation was for the good of his people. But here's the determination in verse 14. This is what he said. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. In case you were doubting his proposition in verse 2 that all is vanity... He reminds you that, hey, I've seen it all. I, I have watched every video there is to watch of mankind. I have listened to every audio tape that there is to listen to mankind. I've seen everything. I've intently gone out of my way to observe man in every situation. And I'm just telling you, I've seen it all. And all is vanity. In fact, all is vexation of spirit. It's vexing. It's perplexing. My spirit is vexed by everything I've seen. It's troubling in spirit. Now, this isn't a man complaining about the vanity of this world. He is simply stating a fact. A fact that doesn't render life under the sun miserable, but unfulfilling for sure. He says, again, I've seen it. Everything man does needs to be done again to bring more satisfaction. Everything that man does needs to be done again to bring more fulfillment. But here's the problem. Good things don't satisfy us. And here's why it's vexing. Bad things don't satisfy us. That's why we have serial murderers. One isn't enough. Solomon observed this. Remember, we just read about alcoholism. And he said, I watched the drunkard. And he, he said, when shall I awake? I will seek it again. One bottle wasn't enough. Getting drunk wasn't enough. It didn't satisfy you. Didn't pain you. You have to go back to it. This is vexing. 
Vexation of spirit troubled him. We keep loving one another because we have to. One day of love is not enough. I mean, I know guys would like it to be that way. You know, your wedding day should be enough for the rest of our life type of deal. But there's a reason your wife wants love every day for the rest of your life. By the way, she deserves it and needs it. But you know why? Not even love fulfills her. Not even love satisfies her. She wakes up the next day wanting more. For that, it's vain. Not vain in a immoral or negative con connotation, in a reality. Like it's not good enough. It's not satisfying. It's, it's like a vapor. People have to keep eating because one meal is not enough. We keep sleeping because one night is not enough. We keep showering because one shower is not enough, right? But here's the vexation of spirit. People keep hurting because one assault is not enough for them. People keep raping because one rape is not enough for them. That's vexing. People keep stealing because one car or one store is not enough for them. People keep drinking because one bottle is not enough for them. People keep killing because one murder is not enough for them. People keep shooting up because one fix is not enough for them. And the list goes on and on. We don't need to go any further with that. Don't you think being a criminal investigator is vexing at times? <coughs> it's troubling. Let's talk about a neutral, not a moral issue. We can talk about bad things and good things, but you know, people have to be treated over and over and over for health problems. That's troubling. My father will need chemotherapy over and over. One isn't enough. That's troubling in spirit. And there are countless people around the world who every day need to take another pill, get another shot, have another procedure, because nothing's good enough. Solomon's observing this. He has to go to the hospital to see the kids, to see the adults, to see people going through pain. This is why it's vexing. It's a sore travail to learn about these things. Amen? Amen? As long as you're with me, verse number 15 gives us the explanation. That which is, this is why it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. He says, that which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting or lacking cannot be numbered. That word wanting means lacking. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. <laughs> Daniel, when he interpreted the writing on the wall for Belshazzar, he said, thou art weighed in the balances and, and art found wanting. You're found lacking. The works of man done under the sun are perplexing and vexing because there will always be crookedness. Because there will always be needs. It is troubling to the human spirit to watch the news day, day in and day out. It's vexing to read the newspaper day in and day out to learn of more obituaries, more death notices, more storms, more wars, more crimes. That's vexing. No matter how good there is in our world, there will always be evil here. No matter how much success in our world there is, there will always be failure here. No matter how many donations we collect, there will always be more needs. I mean, maybe you watched the news and we thought we were done with one hurricane and one plea for donations. And, oh wait, we're on to the next one? That's vexing. It's vexation of spirit. I'll pause here. Um, I remember watching, it must have been the big storm in Houston, which was probably two years ago now. I don't think it was last year. Whenever that was, though, I saw a story of a man who must have been in his upper 90s, maybe early 100s. And he lost his house, <clears throat> and the community got together and rebuilt it. And I think they were able to salvage a lot of his memories. And it was a real touching story. <clears throat> but hearing the uh, interview with this man was heartbreaking. He basically said he has no one left. He's watched everyone die. All of his friends, all of his family members. And I thought to myself, who wants to live long enough to watch everyone die? You know what that is? It's vexation of spirit. That's, that's not a knock on anything. That's just a, this world is what it is. Solomon had to observe that. 
And he says, you know what? Nothing's fulfilling and it's all vexing. Solomon is not speaking bitterly here about the hopeless drunk or the hopeless criminal or the hopeless beggar. No, he's just making a broad statement about life under the sun. He says the world is inherently crooked. It's inherently full of needs. Those needs cannot be numbered. Those crooked things cannot be straight. And let's be honest tonight. This world will not change until God recreates it. Amen. There will always be crookedness. There will always be needs. There will be success stories here and there for sure. This is not a portrait of hopelessness, of depression, of darkness. This, this is the reality of, hey, fight evil, yes. Help addicts, yes. Rehabilitate criminals, yes. Punish evildoers, yes. But there will always be sin. And there will always be people doing crooked things. Even if an entire generation miraculously eradicated evil, even a, if a generation came up and said, we've got the answer, we've got evil out of our life and evil out of the world, what did he say in verse 4? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. Even if a generation said, hey, we figured out how to defeat crime, we've implement this new social program that will make everyone perfect. What did he say in verse 11? There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. He's like, even if we figure it out now, which, by the way, we won't, he says it'll be forgotten. We'll redo it. It's just how we are, unfortunately. This is vexation of spirit. <clears throat> I bought years ago these extension cords, and maybe you're like me where you buy the cheap ones. They're just extension cords, right? The thinnest possible ones, the ones that are made as far away as possible. And they work, but over time, maybe you have an extension cord like me where you can't get it straight because it curls up. Like, you can't even curl it on your arm because it's so twisted from just the few times you put it around something. It's all twisted, and, and you can try to undo it, but it gets right back in the coil again. But that's the world. We can straighten out things in the world, and we can make it look as straight and narrow as we want, but it just goes back, it goes back to its natural form. Even in America, the greatest country in the present world, the most prosperous country in the present world, the most Christian country in the present world, there's an awful lot of crime here. There's an awful lot of homelessness here. There are still plenty of orphans here. There are a lot of needs here. If this is the best, if this is the best it gets in this world, we've got to be honest. That's vexing to the human spirit. Let's make, finally, then, the application. Verse number 16. <clears throat> the application Solomon makes really for himself is something we'll glean from. And what he's saying in verse 16 is a summary, okay? It's a summary of what he just told us. He said, I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. I've, I've been given a blessed life. I've been given a life of luxury. My father handed down a great estate. Lo, I am come to great estate. And have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. That came from God. He was not boasting in any way. He's saying, God gave me more wisdom than anyone else. And then he says in verse 17, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. Pause right there. This is not Solomon telling us of a new investigation of a new intent to go out there and, all right, I gave my wisdom to seek and to search out all the things done under the heavens. Now I'm going to go see madness and folly. It's not what he's saying. He's summarizing what he told you he already did. Because wisdom, madness, and folly is the definition of all things done under the heaven. It's important you understand that distinction. You remember in his prayer to God in this dream, when God said, give, you know, I'll give you whatever you want, what do you want? And he said, give me wisdom so I can discern between the good and the bad. Remember that? He wanted to be able to know the difference between wisdom, madness, and folly. He had to go out and look at life to see what folly looked like, to see what madness looked like. That's why he wrote about the slothful, about the drunkard, about the adulteress. And he wrote about all these elements of man that would include madness, folly, and wisdom. So this, this here, what we're reading, is not a flawed investigation of Solomon. It's not a man getting sidetracked by looking into madness and folly. It's not a man getting sidetracked by curiosity of the darker things of life. It's 
It's not a man becoming backslidden because he looked into madness and folly. This here is the summary of a good man, a young man, a king, who wanted to find out what there was in this world so he could rule his people, by the way, God's people, effectively. And so he says in verse 17 again, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. What's he saying? All right, we go backwards. He says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. That was my investigation. I concluded all is vanity, all is vexation of spirit. Nothing can be made straight. There's a lot of needs in this world. And he says, I commune with my own heart. I had a great estate. I had a lot of wisdom. I gave my heart to, by wisdom, see what wisdom, madness, and folly were all about. And you know what I determined? The investigation itself was also vexing and vain. Like, doing the right thing itself was unfulfilling, unsatisfying. You know why? Because he would never have enough information to say, okay, I know everything there is to know about mankind. Even though there's nothing new done under the sun, do you know how many variations of murder there are? Variations of crimes there are? Variations of assault? Variations of happiness, variations of success, variations of failure. He says, this too, this also, this investigation is just as vexing, just as unfulfilling as everything I investigated. This also is vexation of spirit. There is always more to learn. And the reason it's vexing is because there is always something worse to learn. I've watched enough of these silly investigation shows that you hear these investigators say, I thought I saw it all until I got the phone call. I thought I saw it all. I've been in a lot of crime scenes, but this one I'll never forget. And they say it. I'm always moved by the passion of these investigators retelling the investigation decades later with tears in their eyes, with their face demonstrating the amount of impact it had on them. This also is vexing of spirit. Verse 18, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. We're almost done. Just got to make a few more comments about this final verse, but it's the most important verse in the chapter. Whoever said ignorance is bliss wasn't ignorant of what Solomon's talking about. Because Solomon says, the more wisdom I get, the more grieved I become. The more knowledge I receive, the more sorrowful I am. Solomon is not complaining. He's not whining. He's stating the facts. The more you learn about mankind, the more you learn about yourself, the more you learn about our tendencies, the more you learn about our world, the more sorrow and the more grief you will share. Amen. Solomon's gift of wisdom came with a great burden to bear. We forget that. <clears throat> we don't think about that with the doctors. Think about the doctors, these brilliant people who go through med school, and we see them at the end of the day with the white coats, the fancy cars, the big houses, and we say, man, that must be nice. They get to save lives, live in luxury, they're smart. They did it. That, that must be wonderful. Their gift comes at a cost. Because doctors learned about dying by watching people die. They learned about people getting sick by watching people get sick. They learned to address suffering because they watch people suffer. We may be enamored by the life of a doctor, but I think there's a reason many doctors are depressed. Because they have to watch people suffer and die. They have to watch people that they know they can help. Doctors say, hey, if you do this, you'll be fine. And to watch those patients walk out the room and say, no, I'm not comfortable doing that. They have to bear the fact that they could help that person and that person wants no help. Much wisdom brings much grief. Much knowledge brings much sorrow. 
Can we all agree that Solomon knew more than anyone else in his day? We agree that he understood people more than anyone else in his day? Yeah, right? <coughs> to conclude that, then we have to conclude this as well. That means Solomon bore more sorrow than anyone else in his day. I'm going to submit to you that this book is not the book written of a bitter man. I don't think this is a book written by a miserable man. Do you know what I think this book is, Ecclesiastes? is? I think it's a book written by a heartbroken man. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. He learned about alcohol, alcoholism, slothfulness, the rage and jealousy of men by watching these things destroy lives. He learned about a young man void of understanding by watching them be victimized by evil women. Remember chapter 7 where he says, I looked out my window, I looked through the casement of my window, and I beheld a young man void of understanding? And he says, what's he going to do? Oh, and there comes the adulteress, dressed the way she is, and she lures him in. And by the end of the chapter, Solomon says, that young man would go to her as an ox going to the slaughter. He didn't intervene. He observed. And he had to watch lives ruined, which is why he became so smart. Think of the proverb we often refer to in Proverbs 26, 11 regarding sin. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty gross proverb. Why did he write it that way? How many here like watching a dog return to his vomit? <laughs> Sla you know, lapping it up. Right, you're all getting grossed out right now? Why do you think he wrote it that way? Because he watched people return to their folly. He was as uncomfortable watching this as he would be watching a dog lapping up its vomit. We all love 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon gets wisdom. He goes to Jerusalem and we're told that two ladies come before him. We love this story, right? Two ladies come before him. They have one baby. And they both have the same story, that uh, they each had a baby, but they came with one because in the night, the other mom's baby died. And they're arguing over who the living baby is. Remember this story? And we're all just enamored by Solomon's wisdom. And Solomon says, all right, take a sword, cut the baby in two, and give half to each mom. That'll solve the problem. And the, the mother of the living child screams out, no, king, no, king, give, him, give her my son. She can, don't kill my son. And the mother of the deceased child said, yes, cut the baby in two. We'll take half. And Solomon says, I wasn't going to do that anyways, but now we know who the real mother is. Give the child to, to, to that living mother, or to the mother who is claiming it's her child. And we all applaud. <laughs> Woo, Solomon, you got the wisdom from God. Hallelujah, you're the man. We forget there's another side to that. Solomon was the one who had to bear the sorrow of watching the mother of the deceased child walk out of that throne room devastated, heartbroken because she lost her child. Like We forget about the sorrow that he witnessed. We forget about how he learned how to do that. We forget about the things he observed in mankind. He bore a lot of sorrow by coming to the wisdom he came to. He watched case after case, story after story, ruling after ruling, and life after life. And that brought him a tremendous amount of grief. I wonder, that's why he had so many wives. And I, I have wondered already in my study if he didn't spend a lifetime trying to figure out why he did what he did is vexing. Have you ever had that conversation with yourself? Why do you do that, dude, in the mirror? Why do you do that? It's vexing. Pastor Nugent gave me uh, tremendous counsel before entering the ministry, something I'll never forget, something I share with other people who are contemplating it. I think it was something that was passed on to him that he's passed on to me, but I will never forget it. And he told me, if you're going to get into the ministry, be prepared to live your life with a broken heart. Be prepared to live your life with a broken heart. Some people have even reached out to me in some of the more difficult times they would think for me personally, which I appreciate. They say, hey, preacher, no one probably cares about you. You're ministering, but how, do you, how are you doing? You, you, 
And, and my answer often is, God's wired me to live with sorrow. Like, it's okay. Sorrow's okay. It's a part of who I am. I'm prepared to live with grief. I have to. If I'm going to help a couple, I have to learn from the lessons of watching failed couples, of people I love, ruin their lives. That's how I glean, how I glean wisdom. There's a reason growing up in the church is an asset for a pastor. He watches people walk away from God for his whole life. And that's heartbreaking because those are my friends. Those are my sheep at times. But I take those lessons and I apply it to the next soul and say, hey, pal, don't do it. This is what I've seen. You're doing the same things. There is no book somewhere in the world that you can learn everything that there is to know about people without bearing the sorrow of seeing it happen. There just isn't. Parents, leaders, adults who want to make a difference in the world, anyone who wants wisdom, learn this lesson. The lesson is this. Le leadership, ministry, care, and concern, they all come at a great cost. They all come at a great cost. God isn't using Solomon in chapter 1 to discourage us tonight. He's not using Solomon to depress us. He's using Solomon to bring us some gravity, some sobriety. He's using this man to give us a wise perspective. Because I've run into people who don't want to talk about the bad things of life. I'll say, hey, did you hear what's happening over there? Did you watch the news? No, I don't want to know what's happening it bothers me and it makes me unhappy and miserable and you cannot shelter yourself from the grim realities of this world. There is no fairy tale palace that you can go to to escape it. We want the colors, we want happily ever after. It doesn't exist in this world. That's why God sent Jesus Christ to get us to another world where it does. So armed with the perspective of Solomon, you and I can be better prepared to deal with the burdens of getting wisdom. We will be better prepared to deal with the chronic brokenheartedness of living life in this world. And we can still be joyful. We can still be at peace. But I think if we're more realistic, if we're, if we're more sober-minded, if we're more grave, it will help us be wiser. It will help us help other people make better decisions. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.